Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, and I'm excited for today's guest, um, and I need to have, and I think everyone needs, more women leaders. So this is part of the Top Women Leaders series, and uh, check out other episodes. Andrea Houston of Artitude's Design talks about her company, building her company over decades, and she also talks about some of the most tragic things in her life and what resulted in, in them. And Dame Stephanie Shirley talked about her book, Let It Go, and how she was a child refugee at age five because her parents wanted to protect her from the Holocaust. And later on, she ended up giving away over 67 million pounds to charitable organizations. Um, so check out that episode. Her book is fantastic. And before I introduce you to today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their best relationships through running your podcast. So we help people. We're kind of the easy button for a podcast. We help with the strategy and all the back-end execution. You know, Deirdre, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at how can I give to my best relationships? And over the past 12, over 12 years of podcasting, it's allowed me to profile my friends, thought leaders, and companies that I really love and I believe in and share them with the world. So if you're thinking about launching or you run a podcast and you want, you have questions, you can email us, go to rise25.com and check out more. Um, and also a big shout out to SEM Rush. Um, you know, Deirdre, I use SEM Rush for research, and you know, you can run your SEO, PPC, social media marketing with forty plus advanced tools. I don't. I probably use like like a fifth of it or, or like five percent of it. And all you have to do is enter in a domain, and you basically know your competitors' traffic sources, the rankings, social media results, and so much more. And they have more than six million users. And, you know, one in four Fortune 500 companies is an SEM Rush client, actually. And so uh, they gave me, and I don't, I don't get anything if you sign up for this, by the way, but they were kind enough to give me a, you get a 30-day free trial of their Guru account with no credit card required. That's typically $200 a month. And you can go to inspiredinsider.com slash SEM Rush Guru. And I looked up um, Deirdre you know, and her website, and they have over 44,000 backlinks. And what I love about it is I can see what are some of the most indexed pages on your site so that I should be researching it for the interview. And one of the most indexed is social listening when AI takes over. So I go there, I'm like, okay, I need to check out this because that's a very highly indexed page on your website. So everyone should check out that, that <laughs> post as well. Um, so Without further ado, let me introduce today's guest. Today we have Deirdre Breckenridge. She's CEO of Pure Performance Communications. She's been in PR and marketing for over 25 years, helping senior executives in mid and large organizations with their communications and to their stakeholders. She helps executive communications, reputation management, social media, media relations, and so much more. And she was an adjunct professor at NYU, and she also is a LinkedIn learning instructor, so she actually does courses for LinkedIn. And she's written countless books, check them out, like Answers for Modern Communicators, and her latest one is called Answers for Ethical Marketers. Deirdre, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much, it's great to be with you. This is where I get to stop talking and you, you talk. So, <laughs> oh, um, no. <laughs> you know. Such a wonderful introduction. Um, you know, there, there's, an amazing case story um, that I'm going to have you share, but um, I want to start off with feel first test. I took the feel first test and I'll have you talk about what the feel first test is and just start off the inspire. I think it's really powerful about the inspiration behind the feel first test. Thank you so much for bringing this up because it's a story. The inspiration is a tough story to share, but there's so much purpose and hope behind it. So um, after, I think it's like actually 30 years now <laughs> in PR and marketing, I've always been focused on strategy in communication. And something happened in my world. Um, our daughter, my stepdaughter, Noelle, 
left us. Uh, she passed away mm. and it was sudden and it was tragic. And when that happens, you can only imagine what a family goes through. And I really, terrible. it was terrible. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I step back. We all find our path to grieving. And as a part of my path, um, I realized there were so many questions that I had about millennials and the way that they were communicating and showing up and I couldn't ask Noel. So I started a passion project and I, I didn't even know it was gonna turn into a research study, a test online and the backbone to everything that I do now. So I started asking millennials, uh, over a hundred of them, how do you show up to your conversations? Are you being authentic? How do you wanna be perceived? What builds trust and relationships? And basically, same questions, got a whole bunch of data, I started to record it. When I stepped back, they shared a model with me. They basically said, we want people around us, interactions, communication from leaders and people we look up to, to be open and inclusive. Face your fears. We want empathy. We want understanding and kindness. We want ethics and good judgment. And we want love, love and passion and excitement about causes, you know, social causes. And as a result, even though it was millennials sharing this, I thought, this is human. And it formed a model called FEEL. And it's exactly what it spells. Face your fears, engage with empathy, use ethics or live with ethics and unleash your love. And then I thought, well, how can you use this as a professional, as a communicator? How do you even know how much you feel? And that's why my team and I created the test. And the test is almost like uh, putting you in scenarios, 32 questions, eight questions for each part of the model. It scores you and it recommends exercises. And I'm just so curious to hear how you did. <laughs> yeah, I took it. Yeah. Um, when you first starting on that journey, talking to millennials, did you have, did you have something, some goal in mind of what you wanted to figure out or some hypothesis or were you just seeing where it went? I literally just felt this need mm -hmm. to talk to, it was younger millennials. So Noelle was 24 when she passed away. So I started with the 24, the 25, the 26, and then it got to, you know, the older end of the spectrum. I don't really think I did it with any kind of intent other than just to want to understand what people are going through, how they're feeling, what they're thinking. And I guess I did, uh, I had a concern as much as I share what, how great it is to be on social media and all that you can do for your brand, I was realizing that this highlight reel and also some of the stories that they were sharing were not true to who they were and all the smiling pictures and the hugs and the happiness and look how great everything is. It wasn't so great. Yeah. I mean, I just recently watched the social dilemma, which, you know, I want to watch that. Oh I my God. You will, you'll love it and hate it at the same time, but yeah, it's, oh it's powerful, but it talks about some of those things and it's from the, the people who created these tools. Right. And then talking about the some of the negative impacts of social media. Right. Yeah. We, um, so you created this field test. So I I had a question about one of the questions, actually, because um, there's those I, I love how the test is. Everyone should check it out. You can go to feelfirsttest.com. Check it out. Take it for yourself. It's completely free. You can go on and do it. Um, one of the questions that I that struck me was. When someone shares challenging situations, you share challenging situations, or I'll have you do the, the exact question, but I was wondering where that came from. I'm thinking, should I be sharing challenging <laughs> situations? Someone, someone else shares challenging situations? Maybe I'm going about this all wrong. So then maybe so, rethink a few things. So why don't you explain? I, I, don't, I don't want to give it away, yeah. but let's break it down. When somebody comes to you, and they're sharing a situation, what's, what, what's the natural inclination? It might be to say, oh my gosh, that happened to me. But 
in essence, it's really should be to just sit listen. with it and to yeah. listen and just listen some more and to ask questions about that situation. Yeah. So, so maybe better, you know, I feel like maybe as a human being, we all we automatically want to relate to someone and, yes. and tell them like, I feel what you felt or whatever it is, but, right. but maybe that's not the best instant reaction at all is to just kind of let them talk, listen, and just have them be the center as opposed to, you know, cause then when you say you share your own, then you become the center, I guess, as opposed to them. Exactly. Is that right? And then, okay. yes, because if you really want to help somebody, then you'll just let them go on and share and share some more. And then it's a decision. Like I usually, what, what I've learned through trauma and what happened. And now when I look at other situations, when somebody comes to me, cause I, I naturally would jump in and say, Oh my gosh, yes, I understand. I've had this happen. But now I realize that it's just to listen, even in an email, even when somebody shares something in an email, I refrain from stating anything that's going on. I recognize, I ask more questions, let them come back. And I find that people appreciate it. They do. How has the Feel First test and the research you did change what you do now? So, the, <laughs> well, I, I love this because I had no idea it would change my thinking or process or the way that I work with clients or just the way that I show up. So what it ends up doing, especially as a communicator, when you focus on the art and the science and creating stories and things to share and your messaging, you are really very much focused on your talking points and how you show up and all the parts that get you to an engagement and interaction. And I think we're all really good and skilled at getting to the engagement. And when I say engagement, it could be meeting somebody in a social media community. It could be just a one-off. It could be you're a brand, you're selling a product, and it's a simple transaction. But when you want to get to loyalty, advocacy, trust, and real impact, what are you going to do in a relationship? You are going to feel. And when you apply a feel lens at your point of engagement, at any point, you have a better chance of deepening that relationship. So that means for me, when I do media training, I'm telling executives, okay, yes, there's certain things that you need to say about your brands, about your thought leadership, about your companies, and you're going to show up with your executive presence. However, you're going to apply feel so that you deepen a relationship with the media, with their audience, and there's a process to add that feel lens and to be more present and aware and recognizing what's going on with the person who's even interviewing you. Can you give an example of maybe someone who said, thank you, Deirdre, I use this and I would have responded this way to something, but now I responded this way to something based on, you know, facing your fears, the empathy, ethics. Um, what would be an example of, you know, we kind of bring it to life a little bit. Yeah, I think that the the very first part of the model is so important for executives. And I'll share recently about an executive that I work with. So the face fears is we all have egos, right? Everybody has an ego. And when you work your way up the chain, you have to have a certain ego to get there, right? However, that can be limiting because when you let your ego drive you, you miss an opportunity to really understand what somebody is sharing with you and where it comes from. And it's not always a place of, I'm trying to cut you down. It could be a place of, this is really good feedback and I'm trying to help. So what I tell, I, I work with different executives and, and one of my executives had shared something recently and it was a, a part of her thought leadership and basically she got some feedback that may have normally have caused a knee jerk reaction. But when you use a feel approach, you can step back and question why somebody might say that. What is their frame of reference? Where might they have gotten this from? What do they believe 
around this area so that you're not knee jerking, so that you're not bashing heads with anybody. Look at how polarized we are on different topics out there on social media or even in our group interactions. Yeah. So she That's could, like an understatement. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She, she yeah. clearly said that I, when, when the feedback came in, rather than having the negative reaction, it was, thank you for your perspective and tell me more. So I think that's really important. When you're an executive today, you don't want to put people around you who are going to be yes, 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 and yes, and you do everything right, and let, let's always go this way. You want to have people who give open, a diverse perspective because, I mean, one of the things I learned in my own millennial study was the more you can be diverse and open, you're going to get to innovation because you're going to tap into new ways of looking at things. Yeah. So that's... That's yeah, when I, when I talk to my business partner, John Corcoran, he says, you know, he's better at this than I am, but he'll say all feedback's good feedback. You know, like whatever feedback is coming in, just take it in and, you know, whatever it is, it's coming from someplace, right? It so. does. I, I mean, I share this story every so often. So you mentioned that I'm a LinkedIn learning instructor and I have all different courses on public relations and marketing. And people all the time, because I'm on LinkedIn, and that's a big platform for me, they share their thoughts on, on my videos. And I had one student come into my you know, inbox <laughs> and basically say, um, you know, I didn't like you, the way you were using your hands. It, it bothered me. And you know, anybody could have a knee jerk. I didn't, can you take that personally? Oh, absolutely. But what did I do? I actually said, thank you. I'm going to go back and look at my hands during that segment that you mentioned just to see what it was that you're talking about. And that helped me. Whether I could change it or not, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Otherwise, I never would have known. Yeah. You talk about <clears throat> to being a relationship agent, which is important. Um, Mm -hmm. Tell people what that is and how, you know, people can maybe utilize that. Right. So there's such a big difference uh, between somebody who is building relationships and networking and somebody who is a chief relationship agent. So what I like to do, and um, this comes directly. So I, I'm a podcaster too. <laughs> I have this show called Women Worldwide. And I've been doing If you're watching the video, look behind her, her left <laughs> shoulder. I've got I think the it's left if it's flipped, but Women Worldwide, yes. Yeah, so I, I have a podcast called Women Worldwide, and not my day job, just something that I love, because remember how you said more women leaders? Well, it's about lifting up women, giving them a voice and a platform. So being a chief relationship agent means taking that network of women and making connections so they can do great work together. And I do this, there, there's a few ways that you can do it. So yes, I have people who come, they're on my show and I form relationships, but I bring them into the network and I actually created a mastermind group with some of my guests. And it was completely, once again, an experiment, didn't know anything would come out of it. But this mastermind group, now I'm watching these women in the group and it's free. I did it not, I don't charge. It's so that they can get speaking engagements from one another. They can get media from one another. They can do business together. And that's being a relationship agent. And I always say, if you're in my network, I am happy to introduce you to somebody because I know you're going to do great things together. Yeah. I want to get into a specific interesting case story. Um, but before I do... Um, so I scored a 130 out of 160. So I don't know where that falls, good. good or bad, but... Um, no, that's very that good. Was... I'm almost thinking you might be um, either, you're either expert or mastery. Hmm. Well, I'll take so, that. <laughs> I mean, that that is really good. I have professionals in my own industry saying, I thought I was really good in the area of 
face fears, but apparently I suck. <laughs> I mean, so you just, you never know how you're going to score. Yeah. So I, I thought that question, I mean, I took it as there were several questions of like, okay, it made me rethink maybe how I do things. Um, and okay, well, this question's interesting. I probably do this wrong. I mean, not that there's a right or wrong, but like maybe I could be better at it. So I appreciate it. I think just everyone going through the test, you'll learn something about yourself, you know, whatever the score, it doesn't matter what the score is at all. But so feelfirsttest.com. And then um, from that, what I, what I train, what I help professionals with, whether it's them, their own professional development or with teams is that's the start of your roadmap because you need to increase feel and whatever you can do, the exercises, that's going to help you to be able to apply feel to your brand, which then lets you get feel out through all of your interactions and all of your channels so that you can measure feel in terms of your relationships. How well are you doing out there? Simple transaction or, or uh, loyalty and trust? Yeah. So um, someone read your book. This is uh, an interesting, I guess, case story. Talk a little bit about who that person is and what happened. Okay. So um, this is my favorite case, case study. I was contacted by Richard Bistrong, who is also a colleague, a friend, was a client back in the day. But um, Richard was in prison when he read my book. He had violated FCPA and anti-bribery laws. And um, it was when he came out of prison that he contacted me and he said, I read your book and I would love it if you could help me to sort of um, share my story moving forward, a, a different trajectory and how I want to help people and really educate them on what to do rather than what not to do when you're in business, compliance, ethics, especially when you're in sales. And I worked with him on different themes. We got him ready for getting out there to talk to the media. I worked with him on his social media. And what's interesting about this is that I really had to face fears in a sense and step out of my own comfort zone. There was my own empathy for him. Ethics were involved and just this passion that I had. So I was applying feel back then. I guess I didn't realize it. But even when, so Richard told me, you better Google me. You just better Google me. I want you to know exactly who I am. I'm going to send you the court transcripts from when I went in front of the judge and the prosecutor. And, you know, it's really interesting because even he served five years as a cooperator for the FBI and in the UK. And when he went before the judge, even the prosecutor had recommended that he don't, that he didn't go to prison, that he had really served for those five years helping the government. And the judge basically said, mm, no, you can't do what you did and not serve some time. But after I read everything, I had a really strong feeling about him. And even though I had some very well-intended inner circle members who said to me, mm, don't, no, touch it. don't touch it. What, how's that going to, what are you doing? Why would you do that? Your brand, you're this, you're that. And I just said, no, this, I really feel strongly. So I helped Richard. I'm so glad that I did. We even, we've been on stage together in a, presentation and we talk about how he went from prison card to MasterCard. He does a MasterCard training documentary series. Um, he is one of the top 100 minds in compliance. He works with ethical governing bodies and he just wrote the forward to my new book, which is of course, Answers for Ethical Marketers. I so guess that's it's my appropriate, favorite. right? Yes. What, what was the book that he read? In prison. Okay. Oh, I think, I believe it was putting the public back in public relations. Did he say what, what was it about the book that struck him? I think he saw it as a way to really share uh, a, a, a new kind of um, story. The story that he wanted to move forward with. I think he knew that social media would be a part of it. However, social media is a tough landscape. And, you know, you have to go about it the right way. And sometimes when things happen and you do certain things, 
well, are people going to be forgiving or not? That all depends. And he was very authentic and very genuine in his sharing. And he worked tire tirelessly on his content and really helping as a part of moving forward. And that on social media is a good way to approach it, open, transparent, and, you know. Do what are right. some of the things you did with him? So we basically, we looked at, um, well, especially with the media, what you can talk about and what you can't talk about, right? What's in the rear view mirror and how to move what you learned forward. And I think that that's really important. How to be a giver on social media, how to connect with influencers, how to lift and support others as you also share your own story, how to build community around your own storytelling, but building community so people can also help one another. And, you know, that, that was is, you know, there's strategy, but there's also tactics on how you share and the right way to share through different platforms. How you share on Twitter is going to be different than how you're sharing on Instagram or maybe on Facebook or, or LinkedIn. You know, I used to say back in the day, I still say it now, every community has a culture and you sort of have to fit in with the culture and become a part of that community. I'll talk about my favorite case study that you have in a second. But um, you talk about connecting with influencers. What are some big mistakes you see people making? Because I'm sure you're in social media, you're like, oh, terrible. People should not be doing this. What are some big mistakes? So not, and no, maybe I'm doing one of them. So that's why I asked. So, no, no. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really, it's a good question and everybody should step back and say, I'm, I'm making these connections. What are the ones that, the ones that are working out and the relationships you're carving, you're doing something right. It's usually when you don't know that person, you don't understand that person. You're not taking the time to see what they're doing, what they care about. Connecting with an influencer is a great opportunity. Um, and, there's all sorts of, you know, when you look at influencers, um, it could be your own customers. It could be members of your social community who are ambassadors. It could be the media. It could be bloggers. It could be podcasters. And just like we used to say back in the day with the media, you're customizing, right? You're building a relationship. You have to do the same thing with your influencers. Just because somebody, uh, you see them out there a lot on Instagram and you know, you can't just expect them to share for you. How can you build a relationship with them? What's the right approach? Why would they even want to share what you're doing? What's the benefit for them? How do you support one another? So these are just all important questions to ask and, and things to think about when you're building a relationship. Yeah. It seems to be all about the research, like really research the person or company and see where they're coming from. And so you can customize that communication. It's, it's probably people, you're saying people get in trouble when they don't even bother doing those things. Exactly. So I now have, because I'm a podcaster and, and you, right, you know that when something comes into you that is really appealing or somebody shows an understanding, no matter how it comes in, you're more apt to say, oh my gosh, I, I really wanna have this person on my show. I get all kinds of, I'm also a blogger. I've been a blogger since, I wanna say 2008. Um, I get pitches all the time. I'm sure, yeah. And the ones that really show that they're reading or paying attention or they're a part of the community, those are the ones that I really pay attention to. So one of my favorite case studies, I had to do with charcoal. Do you know what oh I'm talking about? Yes. So wait, that was, was that the Sysimos, the case study at Christmas? Um, really? yes. yes, I think so. But I, I'll let you tell the story. Right. So I have to jog my memory, but we were working with a social media intelligence platform and one of their clients was um, a charcoal company. And I think we were asking, uh, who is the nicest person on social media? What a good question. I mean, yes, I That's love it. Like, it's because what do we see on so, especially now? I mean, my gosh, it's such a, it's a tumultuous landscape, pandemic, 
the election, uh, you know, racial injustice, whatever the issue, you see a lot of bubbling up of anger and frustration. And so back then, this was, this was a while ago, we said, who is the nicest person on social media? Their platform was able to analyze people who don't curse, don't use swear words, who use really nice words, complimentary words, who, who appear happy. And, you know, because the, the platform delves into emotions, it was easy to come up with a winner. So I don't remember if the winner was from Wisconsin. Wisconsin, right? Yeah. The winner was from Wisconsin. Yeah. He's the happiest person on social media. So we awarded him, I think, a year's worth of charcoal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, so, that's and that, great. Was, that was Christmas time. I mean, I think we did it, you know, as a joke, you know, coal in your stocking, but this was a happy, you know, to receive charcoal. Right. But yes, that was a lot of fun. I love that. You know, I just love the question of measure. Well, one, how do you measure the nicest person on social media? It sounds like you like, okay, thank you. Appreciate, you know, whatever appreciative words. And they were able to, to do that. But I just love that question in general um, because it's often, it can be the opposite, you know? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I wanted to have you talk about the future of communication, you know, because so I was watching your talk from, like I think it was five years ago that you did in London and you're talking about the future of communication. And so I was like, it'd be really interesting to hear you talk about going back to that point, what's changed and what do you see is the future now? Um, looking back on when you spoke in London, I mean, a lot of the stuff I felt still holds true to today of the things you were talking about, but um, maybe talk about, has anything changed from, five years ago from when you were you know, your ideas five years ago to now? Yeah. I mean, I think things are always changing. So as I recall with the future of communications, I did touch upon a lot of analyzing relationships and I'm sure I must've incorporated around technology, the internet of things. That's what we were talking about. Then mm -hmm. I was looking at um, measurement. I think all of that still holds true. Platforms are changing. Relationships have to go deeper. Now the feel model is a part of it. Like I said, no matter where you are, you have to be more present, more aware. And in the moment, that's the other thing. This presence and awareness, and, and this is now in the moment, look at all the live streaming that we're doing. Look at how video is a platform of choice for learning for t the the pandemic has us all doing zoom videos with our colleagues uh, internally we're doing more even the media you're you're using platforms like Streamyard or zoom or skype to do your media interviews so i think a lot more being able to show up in real time and that's hard that's hard for still hard for professionals hard for brands because no matter what companies still and there's there's a lot of industries that are regulated so we have to take this into consideration they want to be able to guide messaging as best as they can and it can be in conflict with all of this live and behind the scenes and and what's going on so I just think, and also, of course, here's the big one, artificial intelligence. We weren't, I wasn't talking about fake news and bots back then. And, you know, everything that we can do now with marketing automation. So a lot has changed, is changing, and will continue to change. And we need to always be thinking about the future of communications. So do you feel, when you think about the future of communication, do you think of things like AI or what are, what are your thoughts of people, what they should be thinking about like now? Cause I love talking to people like you who've been doing it for decades cause you have a different, you know, um, scope of what you've, you've seen, you've seen trends, you're looking at trends every single day. So I'm curious of what you see, what people should be paying attention to going forward. So yes, with artificial intelligence and I wrote about this in my book, privacy, security of, of data, knowing when you're actually 
speaking with a human or you're interacting with a bot. So a lot of companies for customer service, it, it's a, it's a helpful bot. <laughs> it's, it's parsing through your information and answering your questions. But you know, here's the thing. And, and this was actually not a part of my book. I think this was in a LinkedIn learning course uh, that I did on ethics you know, there was a, a case study about an app that was being used for seniors. And a lot of these seniors didn't realize that when they were giving information that they weren't talking to a human to schedule and share. And that right there is an issue where companies have to always be transparent and open about the way that they're sharing because there's a, a trust and a bond and you don't want to break that. So I think these are all considerations that are going to become more focused as AI gets more sophisticated. Data and privacy is a huge issue as hackers go deeper and become more sophisticated. And how do we educate people on to safeguard their privacy and what can companies do so that not all that data needs to be shared or needs to be used. And after it's used, is it kept or is it discarded? Everything comes into play here. I have, first of all, I want to thank you. I have two last questions, but first of all, thanks for sharing your stories, your knowledge. Um, and I want to point people towards a few places. Um, DeirdreBreckenridge.com. They can check out more about you um, and your company. You can go to feelfirsttest.com. Um, check that out. And um, the Women's Worldwide. Um, where the else should we? Women's Worldwide Show. Women's Worldwide Any other places we should point people towards that be uh, to check out on our books, or where else should we should we uh, link up? Well, thank you. So, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, that would be awesome. Um, and if you go to LinkedIn, you'll also be able to access through the LinkedIn Learning Platform my courses. And I'm on Twitter, so I'm at Deep Breckenridge. I love to answer questions there. And of course, anybody can email me, <laughs> Deirdre at pureperformancecom.com. Awesome. Yeah, check out all the stuff. Take the test. Take the feel first test. Um, two last questions, Deirdre, is I'm always curious because you've written many books, you have a podcast. What are your favorite books? Um, and your favorite podcasts. So what are your favorite books that, that other people should check out? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I am reading right now a book by Robert Greene, The Laws of Human Nature. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good book. So definitely take a look at that one. Um, I also, I just recently, and, and we have to, of course, keep in mind a sign of the times. I read The Law of Success by Napoleon Hill just recently. Um, it was on my bookshelf forever. And you know, somebody mentioned it and they said, oh my gosh, I've, I've had that book. So I, I enjoy reading books that open up my mind to human nature. An, a Dr. Joe Dispenza, so you are the placebo and becoming supernatural, really, really interesting. A lot are about being aware and present energy and the laws of the universe. So those are some of my favorite books that I can recommend. Have your um, kids who I know are into health related things recommended any other books that you should check out from, from a health standpoint? From a health standpoint, yeah. not no. recently. Okay. That's really interesting, but I bet you if I pinged any one of them, <laughs> they would say, I, although I, I do know my, one, my stepdaughter was reading um, How to Not F Up Your Life. <laughs> At one point, I don't know if that's a health-related book, but certainly I thought that was... <laughs> Is that and the actual title? I think so. I'm not okay. sure if I'm getting the title accurately, but it was along those lines. <laughs> okay. I'll have to check that one out. That sounds interesting. Oh, and, and my other daughter is reading something about being a badass. <laughs> oh, I've seen that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So is it by Jen Sincero or, or I, I, I think that I may think have been. So. so not health books, but that that's what they're okay. reading. <laughs> interesting. All right. Check those out. Um, any podcasts that you enjoy that you listen to either frequently or not frequently? Yeah, so mind your your business. That was a, a good one that I used to listen to. Um, there's, I mean, there's a few marketing podcasts. I think it's marketing with coffee. Um, 
gosh, there's one that I listened to, The Moth. I don't know the if moth. people have, to, that was all about inspirational stories. Oh, okay. So those are just some of them. And okay. I'm always, always asking people what they like, where they're listening, not just listening, but what you're reading. Definitely, I ask that too. And what resources in general are just feeding them? And I think that's how we can all kind of learn and grow together. Cool. First, I want to be the first one to thank you. Check out DeirdreBreckenridge.com, FeelFirstTest.com, her podcast, Women's Worldwide Show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is a great conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity to share. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.